tonight we've passed a certain point you must all go into ihram that is you must make the uh, you must enter the pilgrimage enter into the pilgrimage which you do by a special you may have to make a prayer and you have to put on pilgrim's dress it was exceedingly impressive uh, after that day how people were changed everybody's life was changed you see there are certain rules for the pilgrimage you not only have to wear special dress but uh, there are also other rules which are not absolute but you have to it does affect one's uh, behavior you have to uh, keep a guard on your tongue you're allowed to speak but you're not allowed to hold long conversations and above all you have to avoid speaking angrily to anybody you have to think of spiritual things you have to think of death I said to my wife you know these people uh, it's like as if they became Sufis just for the period of the pilgrimage. That's what the impression we had. Their, their lives were changed. They were really serious people thinking about heaven, about God, and talking in the same way. It was really a wonderful experience that to be again with these transformed people on the boat. It, it, it was a help, a spiritual help to us. I think that gives a very good flavor, mashallah, don't you think? Yes, that was wonderful. Yes, yes, alhamdulillah. And you know, one, uh, what's very lovely about that passage also, it gives you a sense of his gentleness. You know, he's a very, uh, he's a very powerful presence, uh, Martin Lings. I must say that in the I don't know, the 20 or 30 years I knew him, um, every time I would go to his home, I'd have a sort of sinking feeling, like sort of trepidation, that I was going to meet this great man and feeling sort of unworthy of somehow my journey towards him. And then I would knock on the door and there'd be, there'd be this sense of awe almost that I would now be meeting Martin Ings. And then the door would open and immediately you'd see him, all of that sense of his sort of majestic nature it would all sort of fade into the background and one would just be welcomed by this wonderful sort of flow of mahabba and uh, you'd, you'd be sort of engulfed in his just gentle loving kind of company and the way he'd speak so uh, slowly and deliberately he'd, he'd weigh almost every word he was saying so let me read uh, some of uh, martin Link's words uh, so this, the last section of the book is on the Maghribi. And as we said, the, the Maghribi is the, the Western, uh, or called Maghrib, of course, means the West. And Maghribi means Western. So it's the Western script. And the, um, so it, it, it's the direct development of Kufic, uh, the, the Kufi script that was developed in the East. But of course, in the East, the Kufic script didn't go on to become a cursive hand. And other scripts, which we saw already, like Nasr and Rehan and Muhaqqaq and so on, on, on that whole family of uh, Muhaqqaq, Thuluth and so on, they became uh, the great uh, so, sort of handwritten forms. And, um, but in the West, uh, it's wonderful. There's a sort of just organic, continuous development from Kufic all the way through to modern times in this beautiful script. And the... This first manuscript here is from this beautiful giant manuscript that's in the, uh, the, uh, it's in the Turkish and Islamic Museum, I believe, if I remember correctly. So let me read the Maghribi script. So Maghribi is the one, the one fully cursive script developed directly from Kufic. It has always retained a certain solemnity which amply, comp uh, which amply compensates it for not having the impetus so characteristic of some of the cursive scripts of the East. Both Maghribi and Eastern Kufic 
are suggestive of the celestially mysterious nature of what they express. It must be added that they are poles apart in their manner of suggesting this particular aspect of the revelation. The smaller close-knit version is also known as Andalusian. But so this is the larger, the much larger version, and I'll show you some of the smaller versions later. In fact, I seem to remember if I go back uh, one moment. Oh no, it's not. But, but I, I'll, I'll show you some of those examples. Nearly all examples of Maghribi are written on vellum. And uh, vellum was used in the Islamic West far longer than in the East, where, where of course the arrival of the, uh, the, the Mongols and the destruction of Baghdad, of course, led to the close connection with the East and of course the, the, their skills of, of producing paper. Parallel to uh, the Andalusian is a monumental rounder script. And this is the script we're looking at here. If I let me zoom in for a moment on some of this as we're speaking. So I'll just place it where at the beginning of the surah heading here. So, A'udhu Billahi Mena Shaitan Rajim Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Ta Seen. Tilka Ayatul Quran. Wa Kitabin Mubin. There we are. That's the first line. Actually, since we do have a little bit of time, before I read. Um, Sheikh Obak's uh, note. Uh, I just take you through this, um, the, 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 the wonderful economy of this um, script. Uh, and of course you have this feminine curvature here. So you've got this lovely upswinging bear. And uh, if you notice that the harakat are written horizontally. So you don't have this, um, the, the, the scribe doesn't really have to think too hard about how to position uh, the harakat beautifully as they'd have to think of in the, in the muhaqqat script, for instance. So um, here's the sukun, the, this blue circle over the scene. And these dots, if you see over the Allah, Bismillah, the, the dot is, is the Hamza. So this dot is, of course, Hamza al wasl here. And... Uh, so, and then you, you see how beautifully economical. So Allah here, instead of putting, as in, you know, uh, Eastern uh, scripts, you often have the, uh, the, the small Aleph written vertically over the Allah. But that, that small Aleph, it hasn't been written here. There's just a sort of a Fatha within the Shadda above it. So Bismillahi, uh, uh, and then uh, Ar-Rahman. In fact, I'm surprised to see this line here. I would have expected that above somehow. Uh, Ar Rahman, and then here you see a small aleph written in above. You know, the, these are the alephs that are not written in traditionally. Uh, so it looks like Ar Rahman, but it's it, but it's of course uh, with the long aleph Ar Rahman. Uh, now uh, here, here you've got the ta at the beginning here, and then the scene. These just delicate little bumps, and then this beautiful uh, sweeping sort of curving tail to finish the scene. And this above the scene, you've got a word written here, and this is the word mad. So, which means a lengthen the sound of this letter. So that's why you say ta seen, and uh, and then the the ter here, you'll see it has a slightly rounded top. Uh, it's, it, so then the, it's a much softer hand, so to speak, than the nas and so on. It doesn't have teeth. It's much gentler. Uh, and here's the cap. And you see so again, once again, you have the word here, mad. So this is, uh, this is a long, uh, uh, yet. And the, 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 the long aleph of yeah is not written, but it's, it's written above here. And then uh, one of the details of Maghribi is you have um, the, the calf actually only is represented by a single dot. So the, the calf, when you're reading this script, you think, well, is this a, is this a fab? Because this looks like Al Furqan. But uh, Western Kufic uh, de developed when they added the dots. They just, the convention came about in the West to put only a single dot for the Qaf. Um, so, and then here you have a Hamza again. So here you have uh, a Hamza al Wasl in a, in a green, which is the Hamza that elides. But here you have the Hamza al Qat, 
the, the, the one that is absolute, so Quran, uh, Quran so it's, it's a red dot. Uh, and then here with the Tanween, you have these uh, double, like Kitab bin, so you have a double line there and so on. And as I say, it's just so beautifully, the, this letter here, the next uh, line, Hudan uh, wa Bushra lil mu'mineen. So, um, but if you see a uh, hood, uh, the, the first ha is, is a rather unusual um, s s uh, shape. Uh, so, sometimes it's written in this form, which is not so easy to read for a modern uh, reader. Um, and curiously enough, there's no hamza here in mu'mineen. So the, the, really the, the, what's been written here is mu'mineen as opposed to mu'mineen. Uh, I was once told by my, uh, one of my uh, Arabic tutors, if you're not sure which uh, kursi to place the hamza on when you're writing a word like mu'mineen, pronounce the word without a hamza and see if you choose the alif or the ya or the wow. And so mu'mineen, the closest to mu'mineen is mu'mineen. As, as opposed to ma minin or mi minin. So mu minin is the closest you have. So you so the hamza sits on a wow. But, but the hamza hasn't been written in here. It's possible that may be an error for the, the scribe may have intended to drop a little red dot in that later and, and forgot to do that. But if one reads through the rest of the manuscript, then maybe that would uh, become clear if it was an error, because if you find the, the Hamza present, in other words, Mu'minin, you, you'd know or not. Uh, so let, let me read Sheikh uh, Aubak's... Uh, oh, let, let me take this back to the... So the, the friends can be reading the surah heading as well and seeing if they can untangle that. So if I return... Uh, Parallel to Andalusian is a monumental rounder script, considerably less compact, with deep sublinear flourishes, which do not hesitate to encroach on the space destined for the taller verticals of the next line. In fact, on this manuscript, that doesn't happen. Oh, salamu alaikum waqar. I recognize that face from last time. Uh, and uh, but but in other manuscripts you will see like the deep uh, uh, tails of one form touching into uh, the, the tops of the letters of the others. So let me see if I if I come back here. I could then, uh, oh. How let me see. Let me turn this right the, the right way around. So this is the smaller Andalusian text that uh, Sheikh Albaq was talking about, and I can I can zoom in on it. It's a, it's a much more dense and a much smaller script, but again very um, very legible given the fact how small and enormously compact it is. So. So let me give other examples. So this, uh, so the two scripts, the, the Andalusian, and then this other more uh, moderate sized hand, um, the two scripts uh, merged into this uh, average sized script that you can see here. So the very small script was abandoned in favor of this, but it's not a very gigantic scale. So this is quite a manageable manuscript. If you look at the, uh, it's about the same size as the, the, the book of uh, Martin Ling's altogether. Uh, it has the, the sort of same sort of dimensions. So let me quote uh, Martin Ling's while we're looking at this. The celestial lightness of the Maghribi has made possible to use with excellent effect as a contrasting complement some of the most massive ornamental script to be found in the whole range of Quranic art. Again, so you can see something of that here. This, this massive script that Sheikh Khawbak is talking about. But in fact, of course, he has more in mind that the piece we've just been looking at here.
I think this is Surat Al Naml, Ashara wa Tisauna Aya, Makkiya. That's what it says. So I can even zoom in and maybe a bit further so you can get the sensation of the, uh, the gold, for instance. But, but then he's referring to this, uh, the, 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 uh, the massive ornamental headings in gold. He says this, but if such ornamental script, if they, ha if they are heavy, they are only heavy with that heaviness, which is the dew of gold. One feels that the calligrapher has here somehow succeeded in capturing the very spirit of the solar metal. And of course, we've spoken earlier about the importance of the symbolism of gold. Uh, and, and of course, there's Shams is here and the soul around us. And this here, the combination, once again, of that idea of the sun, the symbolism of the sun and the symbolism of the tree, so to speak, rolled into one. The Maghribi artist broadens the lines uh, into shapes from the outset. Oh, now we're talking here. So let me let me put this in context. And um, so the, the the Maghribi artist. Oh, now here we are. So let me. Let, I have to see if I can. No, I have to zoom back out to be able to turn the pages. Unfortunately. Oh, this is a different surah heading here. So I can give you this as a, sep a different example. Uh, so this is, uh, oh, I'm not sure what this uh, surah here says. Surah tel, uh, ah, that looks like Hajar, maybe Surah tel Hajar. And this, this is a, let me zoom in on this roundel to show the difference in, in the, the design of the artist. This wonderful work. Uh, it really is sort of a heavenly uh, design. And again, once you, again, you see the blue color outlining the gold, symbolic of um, mercy encompassing uh, all, God's mercy encompassing all. Shall bring that. So in this image here, unfortunately, it's a little bit out of focus. I'm sorry about that, but uh, it'll give you also a bit an idea that uh, this is a frontispiece from one of the Maghribi manuscripts. But if you look at the 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 star formations in the geometric patterns. This is what Sheikh Obak says about that. The Maghribi artist broadens the lines uh, in these geometric patterns he's referring to into straps from the outset with the result that they become the most salient feature of the illumination. Whereas in Mamluk and Ilkhanid equivalents, it is the geometrical figures themselves which attract our notice. Whereas the central star of the Mamluk painting radiates, in the Maghribi painting, it reverberates. So there's a sort of different emphasis uh, that the, uh, the Maghribi artist, so to speak, is after. And this is the final uh, opening in, in the book, um, which is actually from a fairly recent, uh, well, I say it's a couple of hundred years old, I seem to remember. Uh, whereas the central star of the Mamluk painting, oh yeah, here we are, no, so, uh, what I'm surprised by that I, I don't have, ah, oh, here we are, so let me, let me turn here. So this again is a, a, a very wonderful example of that, uh, the idea of the strap work. 
and that sort of reverberation that uh, Sheikh Raubach is talking about. And then he's also, if you remember what uh, Sheikh Raubach mentioned earlier, the idea that some of the, uh, for instance, the especially the Iraqi illuminators, they had this idea of emphasizing the echo, uh, the echoing pattern, uh, uh, and Sheikh Raubach calls it an echo effect. So you can see that the Maghribi uh, illuminator here is, is drawing on that echo effect rather than the, um, the bursting star at the center with the echo effect sort of diminished as little corner pieces uh, in, 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 the, in the four corners of the, the, the square. The outward radiation is largely outweighed by the vibrancy of the interlacing strap work. We are above all conscious of a mysterious omnipresence which vibrates simultaneously in all directions. I shall give you the other. And this is a very wonderful example of that vibration from the center. So you see this, the star element is really sort of lost uh, in the strap work here. And you do have this sort of echoing effect. There's almost a sort of reverberation between, there's almost a sort of pulsating uh, inwards and outwards almost. Although that's not one of the things that Martin Lings particularly refers to, but that's the, the, the impression I have sometimes. And this is another wonderful example of that. Again, the sort of the reverberation from the center. If I zoom in onto here. I think that might be the last of my slides on the Maghribi to, to correspond with some of these points that Martin Lings was saying. So, with that, Sidi uh, Timur, I think we should then uh, revert to our ideas of maybe discussing mm. uh, or reminiscing mm -hmm. about some of the details that uh, Sheikh Abak may have. Uh, uh, Sidi, uh, what would you say are your, one of your greatest reminiscences of uh, Martin Dings for yourself? I mean, is there, is there an anecdote you could share? If I can. Uh, Think of, uh, can we sort of uh, can yes. you stop sharing your screen? Yes. So that we are visible. Uh, stop oh. share. There we are. Ah. Good. I remember when we 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 showed him round um, the mosque in uh, in Lahore. Uh, I forget the name of the mosque. That, that wonderful. Uh, At uh, one point, I had the idea, or was thinking of leaving architecture in architecture. Yes. And he was quite firm in saying, no, you should finish your degree because you can make beautiful buildings. Yeah, can wonderful. Make, and, 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 and one has to earn and architecture is a good profession. Yes. Because yes. I was thinking of going into Islamic studies or some theoretical sort of thing. Yes, yes. So, so in that sense, I always remembered Yes, that that is what one's aim should be to make beautiful buildings. <laughs> That's a wonderful thing. Well, any uh, I mean, uh, it is wonderful how he was a sort of um, connoisseur, you could say, in beauty. I mean, he, he loved to find beauty wherever it, it lay and he would love, love to present it and encourage people to, to work in any field like that. So. So we really owe, owe this series of talks to Martin Ling's keeping you on the straight and narrow in that respect, you could say. <laughs> so that was always very uh, inspiring and encouraging yes. because architecture is not very easy. I mean, yeah. there's a lot of uh, labor work and it requires a certain training yes, yes. and discipline. So, so Alhamdulillah, once you're through that, then you can really enjoy that profession. As is true with any classical art also, yes. you have to go through a certain discipline 
and then once you master the elements then you can produce music let's say <laughs> well, but there's a, there's an echo of what you're saying in um, something once uh, Sheikh Obak mentioned to me about what his father had said to him as a young man he said uh, my advice to you is to know little about everything but know everything about something mm. so so, uh, so you know you need in your architectural world to to get the everything about something under your belt and then you can start enjoying and yes. in fact there's something very beautiful he says in one of his poems he has a collection of poems in fact many people don't know about his poetry but in a certain sense i would say um sheikh albaik was first and foremost a poet mm -hmm. but he knew he of course he couldn't live on that and he was very um uh you know he didn't uh, he, he he believed very much that poetry was a gift from heaven and you you can you can work at poetry but it doesn't matter unless the muse visits you you haven't received a gift which is worthy but he knew that uh, the only way that you would receive is if you were worthy and if you prepared your soul so to speak to be uh, to receive a gift from heaven and um uh, but one of his poems actually talks about this process about how um, so about one of the few poems which is a little bit didactic and not actually um, immediately of a sort of a poetic content of its own, but it's just a sort of like an en passant criticism of people who write poetry uh, uh, without them uh, having souls which are worthy of producing such things. Because uh, if you try to write poetry for the sake of just writing poetry, it'll never be beautiful. But if you prepare yourself and so to speak, empty yourself and become a vessel uh, where you push, where you put yourself aside to receive one of the muses from heaven, uh, one of the aspects of Apollo, so to speak, to use the Greek terminology that we use sometimes, then uh, you may be in a position to be able to receive a gift that comes from heaven and pass it on, you know, sort of uninterrupted. A little bit like the idea of the fact that no soul uh, possesses their own virtue. You know, the virtues don't belong to you. If, but if you're poor in front of God, if you're a faqir, if you have faqr and you don't get in the way, heaven's beauty can flow through you. And if you, you can't lay claim to it as your own, but you can just become an empty vessel. And, you know, that... that um, so in a way, Martin Ling sort of personified that. And, he, and, and the fact that he was a living expression of that was what was a wonderful thing to be in his company. And to then be in his company when he would talk about beauty and what he found beautiful was fascinating. And I would say that is the thing that would bring me back to uh, this work with Martin Ling's on the Quran project. I was just thinking that, that if at some point you, you could also share some lines of poetry by him. Maybe it's, oh, yes. It's, Yes, one of your shelves or maybe on your computer you could read out a line or two or a poem well i could run up uh, and, and uh, find a line of poetry and run back down again it would only take me a minute but let me in the meantime just uh, talk you through some of um, some of the things that happened uh, on the journey of producing this quran uh, book um, one of the things, of course, I, I, I did see the book early days when I first got to know Martin Nings, and I got a copy of my own. And I think I mentioned the previous lecture last year. It didn't occur to me to read the text for quite a long time. I thought, well, the, the pictures are self-explanatory, and I'm sure the text is just a sort of, um, you know, a, little, a slight additional uh, import. But of course, now I realize that the text is the most magical part almost of the whole book. and. Um, but uh, from the time that I knew Martin Ling's early days, he often talked about the book and the difficulties he's ha he'd had rushing the book to print at the time of the uh, World of Islam Festival. And he had great difficulties preparing the print. And of course, at th that early stage, printing was quite an expensive and complicated process. One didn't have computers. There's a lot more sort of work involved with trying to sort of improve the effect of gold printed in the book and um, how the gold was produced was a very big issue for Martin Lings from the, the very uh, get up and go. And he had, of course, for, for himself, when he'd look at the book and he knew the manuscripts, he knew how disappointing uh, the, the, the images in the book were compared to the originals. And um, 
Uh, and, and so he very much wanted to bring out a second edition. And of course, he knew there are opportunities for improving some things. And, but, uh, but interestingly enough, one of his ideas, I would say, is that he also wanted to remove a, f a few of the examples of the Quran openings in the first edition. And I, and I would certainly recommend to a student of, uh, of Islamic art, don't uh, abandon the first edition in, fa in favor of the second edition of the book. Because, um, uh, and the text of the first book, it gives many more examples of what he feels are failings and sort of the decline of certain traditions. Uh, so there are examples of, for instance, there's, uh, there's a opening in the first book of a, a, a Quran using a, a nasta'liq hand or ta'liq hand. Uh, I mean, he would never consider putting that into the second edition because he, he wanted, in fact, his original title for the second book was Summits of Quran Calligraphy and Illumination. Uh, uh, Sidi Farid, who's really the main, uh, one of the main engines behind this production of this book, uh, he was the one who persuaded him to, to uh, 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 change the title to Splendors of Quran Calligraphy and Illumination. Because I think that would be more understood by the general public. But Sheikh Abay always had in mind the idea of summits, and he wanted to only take the very, very, very pinnacle of what heaven would have loved uh, as the very, very best. And really, there was not very much in the, the book, as you notice, after the Timurid period. I mean, all of those wonderful Safavid manuscripts, and there's various examples of those uh, in the old edition. So uh, many examples are simply expunged from, from, from the new edition, simply because he wanted the, the best of the best of the best, so to speak. And then the other thing you'll notice in the second edition as, as compared to the first is all those sort of various editions like work for uh, uh, dedications, or somebody would come into a, you know, some great potentate would come to visit a library to see a manuscript. They'd come and then they would stamp using their wonderful ring uh, onto the page to show that, uh, you know, Sultan Fulan or such and such a vizier viewed this manuscript on such and such a date. And all this sort of, um, all these sort of elements would be, uh, sort of added to the manuscript. But for Sheikh Obak, that was a total distraction and, and, and a sort of um, abuse of the page. Because especially as, uh, when we bear in mind that the margin for him represented a symbol of heaven, that, you know, that open space is, is critical for the spiritual effect of the page. So uh, in a way, it was quite a radical move, but we, we produced the second book and we cleaned out all of the work dedications, all of the various sort of accretions and all the smudges. And, and even in one or two examples, uh, Sheikh Abayt went so, par, uh, so far as to replace damaged palmettes in, in uh, the frontispiece openings of some of the great Mamluk Qurans, where the, the right-hand palmette was damaged. He would copy the left-hand palmette and reverse it and drop it into the right, simply. And in fact, he mentions it in the introduction to his book. And he says, I'm sure the artist would have agreed with us that it was the right thing to do. You know? um, but I will, I will say of the second uh, edition that it has one slight drawback because in the process of doing this cleaning and uh, re returning the book to its sort of original state, uh, so, so that you have an impression of the opening as it would have first been. Um, unfortunately, in that process, I think that uh, the there was a little bit too much in the way of photoshopping that happened. So if you look at the first edition, you, there is something very pleasing about seeing the texture of the paper and seeing the way that the, the uh, because if you, the, there's a sort of almost too much of a homogenous sort of, uh, it, when you turn page after page here, all the pages feel very much the same. Um, but in fact, in the original manuscripts, there's really quite a difference. But having said all that, you can get an impression of that in the index of this book because we left the index photographs as the unedited versions. And then the edited versions are in, uh, in the, main, uh, the main book. Um, the, little, the, the little sort of thumbnail pictures, they're, they're big enough to be able to get a gist of what the original manuscript would look like. But um, 
here and there, they haven't been color corrected, but you know, there's a few little errors in the book. If, we, if there was a second edition, there's a few little errors that need to be readjusted. But in the first, really... the first the World of Islam festival, that was in yes. 1976, I believe, in London. I, I, th I think so. I, unfortunately, I never saw that and I never went to it. Um, 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 but, and there were other great books that came out at that same time. I mean, um, Said Hussein Nas' wonderful book on Is Islamic sciences came out at that time. And it's the same format as this book. And the beautiful book by um, Titus Burkhart, Sidi Ibrahim, that was uh, also came out, uh, you know, on um, in fact, uh, yes, Art of Islam, uh, Art of Islam yes. Uh, so, I mean, it's really and, the three and, and, monumental and, pieces of work in, in one, I mean, they're really sort of transformational, I would say. And the second edition is from around 2004 or five. You know, I've, I, I've completely forgotten it. It's, it's like a blur, but I, I, I think you're right. It must be early 2000s. I can actually, mm. let me look it up. Um, I think uh, Sidi Farid's uh, typesetting of the book and the text at the beginning is also a masterpiece, I would say. Yeah. I think yeah. it's extremely beautiful. So it really is worthy of the, the Quranic... Uh, let me see. Yes, two two thousand and four, I think. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, two thousand four and two thousand five. I mean, his, his uh, he wrote the preface in two thousand four. Anyway, that's dated mm -hmm. then. So, but, uh, but uh, the, the the I would like to repeat one story, even though I repeated it once before. But I think it really is such a, it's such a moment in my life in a way. I've often mentioned it to people because when I've been trying to describe who Martin Lings is to people, and of course he had such a transformation on my life, but I, I've got this wonderful example I can give. But let me just look up the name of the man here in the introduction um, because where Sheikh Obak is thanking... Uh, Oh, see, uh, he says, our gratitude is also extended to Mr. Bahman Jalali, but for whose private collection of photographs, some of the beautiful Mashhad Shrine Library manuscripts would not have been represented. So uh, this, uh, the, I want to tell you the story of Mr. Bahman Jalali. Uh, what, uh, yes, well, so when, when I'm talking to people as to who uh, Sheikh Abu Bakr is, I just simply said to them, well, he's a saint. He was a saint. And, and you know, you don't expect to meet a saint in your lifetime. But it's a wonderful experience. I, I, I wish anybody could have had the same gift uh, that, I'd be, uh, that I'd received. And um, I, I give as an example often what happened with this book. Um, I was going back to Iran to settle some family business or try to sell, settle some family business in the, the, the 90s. And um, I thought I hardly had any family there before. But then as it turned out, uh, there's some of the fuqara lived there. So I ended up with, so to speak, more family than most. And uh, as I was leaving, I asked uh, Sheikh Abu Bakr, is there anything I can get from Iran while I'm there? And he said, yeah, oh yes, there is something you could do for me. Uh, if ever I do, if ever I reproduce my Quranic calligraphy book for a second edition, I would love to have an opening of the left-hand side page of this particular right-hand side page. It's a very beautiful Timurid manuscript. And I said, well, I, I, I'll certainly do my best to try and find that. So I, I, I went to Tehran and I thought, well, while I'm here, I'll just photograph every beautiful Quran manuscript I can find anywhere. <laughs> so, so I set about doing that because I thought if I could do that, that would certainly maybe give an impetus to the possibility of bringing a, a second edition about. And uh, I got introductions to go to Mashhad. Uh, it was a lot of trouble getting the right introductions there. And I, 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 I went to Mashhad. I, I went to the shrine. Uh, I, I, I spoke to the librarian. And I saw other copies of the same, uh, different ajza of the same manuscript. And the page that Sheikh Abba wanted wasn't in those manuscripts, uh, the, those ajza. And then the librarian told me, oh, your jaws must be the one that's in the vitrine, in the sort of uh, the, the display cabinet. And he said, we never open the display cabinet. The last time that was open was like, you know, the uh, dot. 
And um, anyway, he said, you have to get the permission anyway of Ayatollah Tabasi to allow you permission to photograph. I'm sh- and so I, I, I wrote to him, I pleaded, and he just point blank said no. And I said, but this is one of the most important uh, uh, books on Islam in the Western world. I mean, this is, as, in terms of dawah for Islam, I would say this ranks as possibly the highest possibility in the West. And to say nothing of the fact that if this book was reproduced, we could give copies to the libraries in Mashhad and Iran and so on. No, 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 you can forget that. Never. You know? so, <laughs> so I thought, um, well, Martin Lings is a saint. He's asked me for this picture. And I'm sure Providence won't deny him his wish. So one way or another, I'm going to end up with this photograph. I just don't know how it's going to happen. But one way it may happen is Ayatollah Tabasi might suddenly pass away tomorrow. And in which case I need a photographer on a standby in Mashhad ready to swoop in, photograph the manuscript while there's a favorable new head of department so I can get on with that. So I thought I have to prepare to find a good photographer in Mashhad. I flew back to Tehran. I spoke to a common friend of ours, you may know her, said uh, Sakina. And, uh, and I said, you know, you need to put me in touch with a great photographer who lives in Mashhad. He said, I don't know anything about such things, but I'll put you in touch with Bahman Jaloli, the only great photographer I know. And at that time, I was standing next to a, a lady who was working at the um, Islamic Museum in the, Islamic, uh, in, in, in the, manu- uh, the Arabic manuscript department. And we'd been talking a great deal about Martin Lings's book and Quran manuscripts. And so I was on the phone to this man and I said, I hear you uh, may be able to put me in touch with somebody who could help me in Mashhad. And the first thing he said, Mr. Jalali, was, oh, no, that dreadful, the dreadful new organization after the revolution. They're dreadful people to deal with. I did a lot of work under the Shah's regime. And we were about to produce a catalog for the Mashhad Shrine Library. I took all these photographs and they never paid me for anything. They cut, cut off my work halfway through. And when I asked for payment, they said, you know, just keep the pictures. We're not going to pay you. So he said, so I've got, a, I've got like six sheets of transparencies, which, which I still have. And they never paid me. And as soon as he said that, I said, that's the solution to my problem. I know that the opening I'm looking for, you've already photographed. And so anyway, he laughed. He said, do you, I mean, do you have any idea how many thousands of manuscripts there are in, in the Shrine Library? What's the chances of the, like, the 10 or 20 photographs I have, uh, the 10, 10 or 20 different Qurans I have correspond to the page you want? And he said, is it, is it an opening with a lovely surah heading or something? I said, no, it's a plain text, page of just plain text. He said, well, that's, he said, the chances of that is like a, a needle in a haystack. Uh, he said, you know, one needle in a million haystacks almost, you know, so. You know, I said, no, no, don't worry, Mr. Jalali, I know. Martin Lings is a saint. He wants this thing. Mr. Uh, Tabasi, Ayatollah Tabasi says, no, not, uh, you're, it's never going to happen. The solution must be with you. So I'll just come and I'll get the transparency I want. And he said, well, be my guest. He's almost laughing at the end of the phone. And so I put the phone down and I said to the lady who was with me, uh, we are now in a slow motion unfolding miracle because we know that the outcome is that we'll have the opening. And she said, no, this is just ridiculous. I said, well, just mark my words. So we got into a taxi, drove down to the bottom of Tehran. Uh, we walked into his house. He invited me to his little studio. I picked up one set of transparencies. I looked and said, no, not here. I picked up the second one. I said, that's the opening I want there. And <laughs> <laughs> anyway, and then and two or three other openings that, she, in fact, Sheikh Abayt found particularly beautiful also entered into the book as a result of that little collection of transparencies that this man had photographed. Beautiful. And so, so it shows you the kind of sort of baraka, you know, I just, it just it's a foregone conclusion. Sidi Abayt would like to have this. It'll just happen. How Providence has organized it, you know, so, it yeah, makes one think of uh, quantum mechanics a little bit that, you know, uh, the past, the present, the future, they're all sort of almost simultaneous. It's like the world's already happened and we're just living through it, but it's already taken place somehow. <laughs> MashaAllah, this seems to be the right moment perhaps to 
because we are nearly so open. Uh, time, you know, only five minutes to go. Oh, yes. Uh, unless you would like to add anything as a well, well uh, uh, let's see. Of course, I've hardly spoken about um, uh, Sidi Farid, who actually became my future father-in-law. Uh, so he was involved very closely with this. And, and I would say possibly one of the most delightful parts of working on this project. Uh, also, Mahmoud Rash was originally also involved in this project. It was like a three-way project to try and push this project forward. Sidi Mahmoud then became uh, preoccupied with other things and he, he left it, the project to myself and Sidi Farid. And then um, I had all the transparencies with me, uh, the bulk of transparencies with me, which I'd taken from Iran and from different libraries and Turkey, especially. I did a lot of photography there. And um, so I had this mountain of beautiful uh, uh, manuscripts and I invited Sheikh Hobak on maybe, I don't know, maybe five or six or seven different occasions up to my home in, uh, in Oxford. And can we would I, spend I, hours. Can uh, I interject here? What's that? I wanted to interject here. Yeah. Yes, please. And it was my really a great fortune and good luck that on one of those occasions I was staying at your house. Oh, how wonderful. So on the occasions where we're looking at the manuscripts. Yes. So, so that was uh, a great blessing to be in the same house as Sheikh Obakar. Uh, did, well, did you come through into where we were uh, with that little study where we had set out the manuscripts? Did you see that room? I did, but I wasn't there mostly, but just the discussion. Oh, I see, I see. Over dinner and breakfast and lunch. Yes, and yes. And all of yes. those big, big printouts of the calligraphy. Yes, yes. But it, it was, program. I would say, one of the greatest blessings of my life, that period. Uh, at Sidi Farid and I, we were, uh, we were very aware of the monumental blessing that we had because we just sat down for hours upon hours sitting uh, looking through our sort of, um, you know, using a light box and looking carefully at different manuscripts. And we snuggled up almost, you could say, to uh, Sidi Abu Bakr. And we'd be looking through the magnifying glass at different things. And then we'd, we'd be passing the magnifying glass backwards and forwards. And Sidi Abu Bakr would say, oh, but I, I, I love this aspect of this manuscript. Or, but here it's a little bit, uh, you know, and I'd rather have that page. And then we'd look at different openings. And then he would look at the... the uh, the, the particular text or there would be some little element that would capture his imagination. He would say, no, this, and then what was very beautiful is that, uh, what was very educational for us, I mean, Sidi Fard and I would present him, so to speak, certain pictures and say, no, no, surely this one. And then Sidi Albright would say, no, no, that's, that, that's not, that's not that's very beautiful. So I don't know why we're looking at that. And, and we would be surprised. And then he would pick up something else and he would say like, no, it, it, to use your phrase, Sidi, uh, I mean, he wouldn't say that, but he could almost have said, Vah, you know, it, it was like, uh, and then we would then learn, oh, this is, is worth looking at. So we would sort of have new eyes for seeing things. And then he would explain, ah, oh, you see the balance here or the color here or the, the way everything's in proportion or um, so. And then we would, uh, we, we certain, uh, some of the um, openings in this book, it was a close run thing, whether they got into the book or not. And Sidi Farid and I would be on great campaigns to try and uh, twist Sidi Farid's, uh, Sidi Abu Bakr's arm to please include that. And he said, no, but Sidi, I don't like this element. That There's too much of that element of decadence or, or such, such a thing, you know. But we did get a, one or two openings in that wouldn't have, let me, what I could do is I could give you an example of one of the elements, you know, that, that beautiful, a very a large golden black muhaqqaq uh, Quran that was produced for Sultan al Jaitu in Baghdad in the 13th century. Uh, it has, uh, I mean, that's one of Sheikh Obak's very favorite manuscripts, I would say. But um, it has some illuminated pages at the be beginning and the end. But some of those pages, they had a rather a slightly decadent feature of so that. You know, the, the way uh, some manuscripts have that sort of cloud element placed between oh. the text. And he wasn't very fond of that. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, if I, since I don't want to be able to look at, uh, can, can you see this if I do this? Here we are. Yes, yes. Uh, so so is, this is the manuscript I'm speaking of. But 
we had a very beautiful opening of it, uh, which is, let me see if I can find it. Can, I don't know if I can, let's see. An illuminate page, I mean, I would say, Sidifar and I, with great difficulty, persuaded Sheikh Aubak to please also include this. But you see, uh, there, there's one or two, the, the, this element is just getting a little bit too light-hearted. So, so it's a, there's a little bit too much of the encroaching into the direction of Mahabba here. And um, despite its very, very majestic appearance, uh, Sheikh Aubak would have preferred almost to have let the viewer only see these summits whereas here he could tell there's just one or two footsteps away from the summit here uh, and uh, but he reluctantly gave way to us sort of pleading the case of this <laughs> opening for instance um, and i, I think there was some uh, discussion i seem to remember that uh, to increase the number of plates on the pages uh, yes well uh, actually curiously enough you know the first uh, um, book the first edition has 114 plates and of course there's 114 surahs in the Quran mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it was a complete uh, coincidence in a certain sense I mean Sheikh Obay never planned for that mm -hmm. but when it came to this book it really um, of all the material that we had I don't think we ever <coughs> um, decided to have fewer or more plates uh, Sheikh Obay simply went through everything that we had and chose the most precious things that he, he found. And it, it came to this number of plates. It, it wasn't trying to set out a certain number, let's say. Um, Wonderful. That's I okay. can't think of, uh, uh, I'm sure, well, there's a thousand other things I could have added, but maybe we'll, uh, I'll, I'll mention those in other lectures. Mm, uh, we we'll look forward to uh, that. Sort of uh, footnotes. Actually, one thing I could say is that I'm looking very much forward to the next series of talks. I don't know when that will be or when you want me to talk on that, but I'm, I'm looking forward very much to talking about the subject of evolution. Um, oh, yes, I completely forgot about that. So, inshallah, yeah. yes, as yes. soon as you're ready, after after Eid, we should yes, have that yes. At, yes. at your earliest convenience. We are... Yes, well, I'm, I'm working on this. The, the problem there is there's so much to say, and the recent work on it is so vast. And quite honestly, the, um, the, the argument now against evolution is becoming so compelling, even on a scientific basis, that mm -hmm. it, I think most people wouldn't have the first idea that that's the case. Most, you know, the, the public at large has this, you know, the, this sort of this, the, the way the scientific community at large has sold the idea of evolution being a sort of done deal, so to speak. Mm. But in fact, there's a great deal of scientific evidence as to why uh, evolution is really more or less a sort of nonsense idea. And, and uh, perhaps it would be for some people sort of uh, uh, out of place to be talking about evolution. So therefore, one should mention, I would like to mention yes. that Martin Ling's uh, in his works, that this was one of his topics on which yes. he wrote. Well, I once mentioned to Sidi Abu Bakr, uh, I would love to organize maybe a series of talks on evolution at Oxford. And he said, oh, that's a wonderful idea. If you ever manage to do that, please uh, uh, let me know. And I would love to contribute. Because he was a great, great critic of, of yes. evolution. So therefore, it, it does match up with the series that we are having. Yes, and of course, uh, and uh, Sidi Ibrahim uh, Burkhardt, I mean, it's wonderful things he's written. And of course, Sheikh Hussein Nas also. But, uh, but the modern arguments are, are, are wonderfully compelling. And they're from so many angles. The problem is uh, any sort of scientific theory, it's very difficult to displace an idea if you don't have the alternative idea that trumps the idea, so to speak. And the problem is there's nothing that... Uh, the modern mind can accept as the solution to what is actually going on. So the, the a dreadful idea like evolution continues to sort of, so to speak, poison people's minds, you know. Mm, um, very right. I mean, very but I, I'm quite a heretic myself in a certain sense when it comes to evolutionary thinking, because I do think there are elements uh, of evolution, so to speak, that are maybe sort of plausible. But, not, but, but what's totally unacceptable 
is the idea that um, the, world, the universe is like a sort of cosmic burp. And by accident, this burp managed to burp up something very interesting like life. You know, it's, it's just, it makes no sense whatsoever. Um, so once you take the idea of design or, or, or deliberate um, choice of a designer out of uh, the, the natural world, uh, it, it's a nonsense. You can't get a greater from the lesser. <laughs> But anyway, but that, I think it would need a series of talks as well. But I think that would need uh, a few little video clips and, and so on to... Um, I to think do, that, this, that might be a great idea, what you just said. Yes. That it could be a continuing series. Yes. Uh, maybe once a month or something. Yes. Uh, we'll just pick up one, one let's say, video yes, or, 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 or a text up, one, and, and you comment on that. That's all yes, in, in fact, that was almost an easier way to deal with it. Um, but, you know, the, the, uh, a sort of closing comment on that would be, I would, I would recommend very much anybody who's interested in this idea um, to look under, uh, just search under the idea of intelligent design. Uh, because the, the, the scientific community that's very much pushing for the fact that, uh, you know, uh, Darwinism, well, uh, you know, Darwinian evolution makes no sense. Uh, mm -hmm. You can find this wonderful category of scientists, people like um, Behe, uh, Mayer, uh, and, and a few, few others underneath this heading of intelligent design, mm -hmm. um, uh, Dewar and so on. They're, they're, they're wonderful authors. And then you have, uh, from the philosophical side, there's a wonderful um, uh, mathematics lecturer at Oxford who's challenged, uh, you know, rabid uh, evolutionists like Dawkins in public. Uh, uh -huh. He's a man called Lennox, and he, he's a marvelous uh -huh. speaker. So if, if, if you follow some of these strands, when we meet again, uh, some of the other things will fall into place more easily. Let's yeah, say. I look forward to discussing this with you uh, in the coming Which days. Not. Yes. And um, would like to thank you once again from Astonist and myself. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. And I'm sorry there wasn't that much more of the talk to, to give to this no, time around. No, no. It was more reminiscent. It's equally, equally important to talk about uh, Dr. Martin Leeds. Yes. Well, my, my salams to all your family and uh, thank you so much. It may be a blessed Ramadan for us all. Thank you. Khuda Hafiz. Khuda Hafiz. Salam alaikum. Khuda Hafiz. Ah, Muzna Abhi. Gigi. We have one. one. Oh, yes. yes. Oh, is, is there a voice speaking in <laughs> the yes, wilderness? I, I, I've stopped the live stream so we can uh, chat. Oh, fine. Oh, well, well, we can stay together then and have a chat. <laughs> well, well, I can tell you a few more things about the evolutionary aspects, Sidi, which, you, which you, you might find tempting. And I could give you a five-minute roundup. But, but did, did, uh, is that Muzna Malik I see on, the, on screen? Well, was there a question that I heard there? Mm. She was just saying hello. <laughs> oh, no, I see. No, hello. You. <laughs> um, no, but, but on the evolution aspect, for instance, let me give you a, a for example. Um, the uh, 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 Lennox has a very wonderful example. He, he says, um, you know, if you have this idea of the you know, modern scientists tend to have this idea that all truth now is basically through the scientific method. Anything that's not science and reductionism can be discounted. And, um, uh, you know, the, 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 that's the approach. Uh, he said he was at a dinner with a, with a man who's insisting that reductionism is the only way forward uh, <clears throat> and, um, uh, uh, and, and, and materialism. And basically everything can be, you know, everything that's true is what you can, the senses can perceive. And um, so he... he uh, uh, Lennox said to the man, well, uh, what are you going to have for dinner tonight? Because they were sitting together at the top table at one of the colleges. And the man looked at the menu and he said, I'm going to have the roast duck. And then, then the Lennox asked him, how do you know that's roast duck? And he said, well, it's written here, roast, for instance. And he said, well, how do you know that means roast? And he said, well, it's the letters R-O-A-S-T. You know, by my reductionist method, I can see... And I know that I can assemble these letters together to make the word roast. And he said, well, all right, so you've used the reductionist technique. 
But now we, if you use the empirical technique of seeing the piece of paper and the ink, uh, there's nothing else you, you, your method allows you to get to the idea of roast. Wow. Because you, you, you've only got the, the word assembled from its parts and you've got uh, the paper and the ink. But the idea of where roast duck comes from is totally missing in your universe and your method. Mm. Now, and you're saying that all truth can come through these two processes. Beautiful. But in fact, uh, you can't even justify reading the word roast of the roast duck. And then yeah, the man was sitting next to his wife uh, who'd come along to the top table. And the wife turned to this uh, professor and said, see if you can get out of that, darling. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so th th that sort of gives you the sort of wonderful sort of idea. Now, what Lennox's answer to him was, well, actually, this is just a very small word, but what the, the, the biggest word we know of, the longest word we know of, is about three billion letters long. And that's the, 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 the DNA uh, sort of strand in the cell. Mm -hmm. said, so you can't read the word roast using your scientific method and the reductionist principle. And yet you want us to have to, uh, the, you, for you to tell us that you've understood how to read this word. And he said, that's just one example of little sort of detail. Um, but the other thing, for instance, uh, Stephen Meyer, who's part of this, uh, who heads up this group uh, who, call, uh, who are pressing for this idea of intelligent design. Mm -hmm. He says, you know, uh, if you look at um, the scientific methods that are used, there are different types of method actually used. It's, it's not always the same scientific method. So if you're, if you're carrying out an experiment with materials, you can actually have a direct experiment. But certain experiments in science, you can't do directly anymore because they're in the past. So the, the Darwinian method, the scientific method Darwinian, is to infer... Uh, the best inference of the past based on mechanisms that we know in the present. Oh. So, uh, so you, then you would look for different sort of processes now and then project that back and use those as elements to make your conjectures and hypotheses for the past. Mm. Uh, now, he says that uh, that might have worked for Darwinian, which is always on shaky ground up to about the 1950s. But in 1953... Crick and Watson discovered uh, the double helix DNA chain. And by 1957, Crick, who had actually in the, in, in the war years had been a code breaker for the Allies, he worked out, he was the first person to really grasp the idea that these four molecules that interlock at the center of the spine <coughs> of the DNA chain are actually not important in the biological world as chemical compounds they're important as being distinct from each other so you can think of them as letters of the alphabet they're like a coding process so you have a g and c t the 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 the, the, the four that pair up together and it's only two of them will ever pair together so in a way it's like a zero for for g and t together and and a and uh, i think i forget uh, arnine guanine cytosine i forget which ones pair together like that so, so if, I, if I turn my hand upside down like this, this is a much better example of it. So this is one <laughs> pair of the, you know, the center of the spine of the DNA, and this is another pair. So in a strand, in a single cell that you can't actually see with your eye, at the center of that invisible little cell on your skin is an uh, unbelievably smaller center, which is the, the, the nucleus. And inside that nucleus, folded up, is a, is, is a, uh, are 23 strands of this DNA. And there are 3 billion letter pairs like this arranged very, very critically. And the slightest mistake in them could actually produce a terrible disaster in the organism as it unfolds. Um, so he says, now let's use Darwinian's own principle of inference from what we know we know now that the DNA is code and that the, 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 the four base pairs can be represent, are representative of, of encoding information. So the DNA string is a word. It has a meaning and it has information. 
you can compare it to a computer program. They're exactly equivalent. Or you can compare it to words written in a book, uh, you know, sort of novel or, a, a, you know, a, the Bible or whatever it might be. So that's information. Now, if somebody gives you a book or somebody gives you a computer program and says, now let's write another computer program based on the computer program we have. I mean, if you've got like Photoshop, but now you want to modify the Adobe Photoshop program and turn it into Illustrator program from Adobe. Could you ever conceive of getting from Photoshop to Adobe by random changing in the code? <laughs> Hello there. All oh, right, I'm just, just running. So there we are. So uh, the answer is no. So by using modern inference, from it, the only context in which in the modern world we know that coding exists is only in the context of conscious mind and designers. Mm. So when you see code, you must, by scientific method, by inference from, from what you know, infer mm. designer. So if you see code in cells, you must infer design. That's a wonderful sort of point for one session. Just, just to make that point is good enough. In fact, that one point is already enough to blow everything out of the water. Yeah, exactly. But, but, but in, uh, I'll just give you one other little quick example as I dash out of the door. There are 20 amino acids. Uh, of which for, and for using those amino acids, you can build proteins. A single protein might typically be a chain of about, let's say 100, 200 or so uh, amino acids just linked together. So it's like a sort of, you're like threading beads on a string in the right order. Imagine you've got tw 20 different color beads and you've got to string them onto a string in, in a, a very particular order that's only 200 beads long but it has to be exactly that sequence. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, that sequence won't encode for a particular protein, which has to fold in a particular way to have a particular chemical function. So you have to have exactly that, or very, very slightly removed from that coding to be able to get that protein. Now imagine that you can magic away all the horrific complexity of how you can actually get those elements to combine. Because mm. that process in itself is a miracle beyond all imagining, Steve. <laughs> because it includes the ribosome, which is a gigantic protein, which can, uh, w which has to be made uh, using um, DNA code as well. So the the ribosome, the key, the the, the the so to speak, the printer that reads the DNA copy, which is the RNA, that then produces the protein chain itself is a machine of unimaginable complexity. But put all of that aside and put aside all the problems of uh, assembling all the amino acid components, the 20 different components together. Now imagine you have to shuffle those 20 pieces to come into the, exactly the right order. So imagine if you have only 50 different, uh, uh, a chain that's only 50 long, it'd be like shuffling a deck of cards. Imagining if you had to have a deck of cards that's, you know, one, two, three, four, five, and then jack, queen, king, ace, or, you know, up to king. For, and all of the cards have to align in exactly their, their sequential order. I mean, the probability of getting that in one shuffle is one times 10, because there's 52 cards. Oh, and then there's 52 different types. So, so it's, it's 52 times 10, to the uh, to the 52, uh, it's, it's one chance in 52 times 10 to the 52 is the probability of making one shuffle to get all of the cards in the correct order by chance. Now the protein that we're wanting to get, let's say the hemoglobin protein, which might be about 200 units long, it means you have one random shuffle, and it's it, it, there's 20 proteins, so it's mm -hmm. 20 times 10 to the 200. There's one chance in, in, in 20 times 10 to the 200. Now, 10 to the 200, there's only in the entire universe about 10 to the 60 atoms. So what ba basically the, the evolutionists say, for every single atom in the universe, starting at one end, counting to the other, for each atom, shuffle once. And when you get to the other end of the universe, what's the chance of having stumbled across one protein? 
well, the whole universe is only one times 10 to the 60, but we need to have 10 to the 200 to have the chance of randomly stumbling across one sequence. In fact, the idea of having like monkeys typing for an infinity is actually ridiculous because the universe isn't big enough and old enough to even give you even the slightest, the snowball's chance in hell, as they say, of finding one protein by chance in the mm-hmm. entire history of the universe. That's and a that's, strong it, argument. He said, and, and that's just for a protein that's only 200 units long. But the main protein that encodes all the proteins is a DNA chain of 3 billion units. Oh. So, I mean, you, this is like to, to randomly shuffle, you know, 23 chromosomes in a cell is 10 to the 3 billion. I mean, th- these are mind-bogglingly ridiculous numbers. So on a mathematical basis, Darwinian uh, random approach simply falls down. Mm, you can that's only, another strong argument. You, know, you can only program a program by having a design of the concept you want. You have to have the end point in view to be able to then design towards it. You mm. have to have design engaged in the design of uh, the DNA and the proteins. I mean, just even this talk is so wonderful and... Uh... Yeah. I mean, and that, and that's the end of it. But as Julius Caesar says, people believe what they want to believe. 